Good morning. Reda, thank you very much for the nice introduction. It's great to be uh, now a local here from Berlin. I uh, hope you enjoy this city that is a constant construction place, as you see around you, it has always been over the last 15 years. And just very close, uh, they built a new, the old castle new, the opera new, and uh, the museum island, everything is under construction here in Berlin. So I hope you also have a chance to see something beside this interesting meeting here. So uh, my task is now to discuss a bit the data we have available um, as far as today about um, left atrial appendix closure. Um, where are we now? Of course, you are well aware that the background for this uh, concept is that um, we have observed in both um, autopsy study as well as many uh, TEE studies that the majority of thrombi we can detect in the left atrium in patients with atrial fibrillation is localized to the left atrial appendix. You see here a summary um, of these elder data where you see both uh, TEE studies and um, autopsy study show that more than 90% of the thrombi are seen in the left atrial appendix and that was the background to this to, to um, provide an alternative for anticoagulation by occluding the left atrial appendix as an approach to reduce the risk of stroke in these patients. Now, of course, as you know, the left atrial appendix is a very individual structure, actually very beautiful. It's a remainder of the embryonic left atrium, and we, uh, many here in the room, think that we don't actually need the structure. As you know, uh, surgeons are often cutting the uh, or isolating the left atrial appendix during surgery, and there's now a large trial in Canada actually going on uh, comparing uh, basically the isolation of the left atrial appendix during surgery to uh, normal surgery without this. It's a very individual structure, and uh, I found very interesting a recent study that took advantage of this to detect whether <coughs> indeed we can get further evidence whether the left atrial appendix is related to the risk of stroke, and you see here this nice um, differences in the shape with uh, quite fant fantasy names you see on the left upper part, the chicken wing morphology, which is a more simple structure of the left atrial appendix, but you have more complex structures such as the cactus shape or the uh, windsock and cauliflower shape where you see you have um, more likelihood to develop trombi, trombi because it's a much um, more, um, let's say, um, distinguished structure. And indeed, in a large analysis using uh, data from more than a thousand patients where there was a uh, CT or MRI scan available of the left atrial appendix. Um, the group of uh, Dr. DiBiase and others um, have seen that if you have a simple anatomy of the left atrial appendix, the chicken wing anatomy, you have a substantially lower risk of stroke in this analysis here as compared to the more complex anatomy such as the non-chicken wing anatomies. I think this is another nice hint beside the um, autopsy and TEE studies that indeed the appendix matters for the risk of stroke. I would like to see this data confirmed in another uh, study, but I think it's an interesting hint in this direction. Now, we have already heard from Professor Diener in the opening talk that indeed there are problems. Many patients that have atrial fibrillation and have a high risk of stroke are not anticoagulated. These are data from Sweden that have, I think, a very um, good healthcare system, but still you see after two years, um, uh, there's about 50% of patients that had already a stroke and had atrial fibrillation who were not uh, anymore on anticoagulation at that time, of course, with warfarin. So there is a big clinical need. I think there are many patients who are not anticoagulated for different uh, reasons. Of course, the history of appendix closure is much shorter compared to the history of anticoagulation. This was one of the early works here where the, um, anti the occlusion of the LAA was described using a catheter-based technique Down by Horst Siebert uh, with the Plato device that, as you know, is no longer available. And at that time, you see in the conclusions below, um, this was basically suggesting the feasibility of this technology, but uh, further trials are needed to show long-term safety and efficacy to reduce the risk of stroke. And at the same time, Professor Meyer used already uh, other devices to occlude the appendix. So it's a bit more, I think, than 10 years ago that this has started um, to develop. Now, just uh, last year, there was a very nice debate in the circulation uh, journal about um, 
the uh, pros and cons of left atrial appendix closure, and this is a summary of the data from last year. Um, I don't know if we have actually a pointer available. Uh, you, you use the mouse, or you can uh, use the... Uh, you have a mouse, you have a mouse here. That or you can, use, um, you can use this, no? no okay, we don't. no problem. Um, you see the, the summary of the data here. On the left side, you have the um, Watchman data, of course, the PROTECT AF, uh, the PREVAIL and the uh, ASAP uh, study, which are patients who could not or had a contraindication to uh, anticoagulation. And you see the numbers below. It's in the range of uh, 400 to 700 uh, patients in these uh, studies. And you see the other um, data that were published as of last year are uh, um, in the range of 70 to 150 patients. One uh, study also from Bern uh, published by Fabian Niedlesbach and colleagues um, with the ACP devices, more than 150 patients. So there's sort of the uh, database available. And of course, compared to the anticoagulation data, the numbers of patients included in such studies are substantially lower, um, which is also frequently the case in device-based studies because it's very hard to include such a high number of patients as we see in the anticoagulation trials. The, ma the main uh, data we have, I think, from randomized uh, studies are, of course, uh, based on the PROTECT AF study, where patients were randomized to uh, 45 days of anticoagulation or anticoagulation with warfarin. And uh, in the device group, where anticoagulation was stopped after 45 days, patients had then aspirin and uh, clopidogrel, and after six months, then only uh, aspirin. And uh, in this device group, about 86% of patients could stop the anticoagulation after 45 days according to the criteria from the uh, TEE. If there was a leak of more than 5 millimeter, the study recommended to continue anticoagulation. And I will come back to that uh, later. In this study, there was a primary efficacy endpoint, uh, of course, of stroke, uh, hemorrhagic stroke, death, and uh, embolism. And there was a safety endpoint of excessive bleeding and the procedure-related uh, complications mainly. Uh, this just uh, last year, we saw the uh, publication of the four-year data from this PROTECT AF, and I think this has been uh, discussed at the Euro PCR meeting as an important uh, study. And in fact, uh, if you look at the efficacy endpoint from this study, there was a reduction, a significant reduction in the uh, primary efficacy endpoint compared to the anticoagulation with warfarin. As you know, there has been a large discussion with the FDA panel about this data. And the FDA felt that in the warfarin group there was a particularly high risk of intracranial bleeding that may have somehow contributed to that results. But I think, anyway, the results are encouraging for the approach of LAA closure. I'm sure if the data would have been the other way around, it would have been a problem for this approach. Now, here are shown from that four year follow up published in the JAMA end of last year the data on the individual endpoint of cardiovascular or all-cause mortality, and you can see both um, actually were significantly reduced. So both the cardiovascular mortality was lower in the device group in the four-year follow-up of the PROTECT AF data and also the all-cause mortality, and that, of course, was very encouraging data for the LAA occlusion approach. Now the FDA recommended to another a study, in particular focusing actually on the safety of LAA occlusion that was the PREVAIL study that enrolled 461 patients, randomized then 407 patients to Watchman occlusion or the uh, warfarin treatment. And in this um, impl attempted implant was 265 patients and then finally 252 patients um, had the device implanted. Uh, this trial was mainly also targeted to address the safety of this approach, so they were unexperienced and more experienced operators, and um, the data for safety were favorable. The data for efficacy are shown here, also published in last year in uh, circulation with the uh, longer term follow up, and there was no significant um, difference in the primary outcome uh, in the prevail study between um, LAA occlusion and anticoagulation with warfarin. Um, so, overall, the primary efficacy endpoint, there was um, a numerically higher number of strokes in this study in the um, LA occlusion group, and that um, was different to the PROTECT-AF study before. However, if you take the, all the data together, 
there is no significant difference in strokes between the two um, approaches. Of course, there are more devices developed, and we will certainly hear later today about the uh, AMOLED and the ACP occlusion device that you see here uh, in a 3D um, echo uh, imaging after the occlusion of the left atrial appendix. Um, we have performed a CT follow-up using this device, in particular to address the question how uh, big are the leaks that you have into the LAA um, after this implantation, and we will have a dedicated talk to this this afternoon. In our analysis, we did not see um, more than five millimeter leaks after LAA occlusion with uh, ACP in all these patients, so that is something with this device that we do not observe and may be a favorable um, observation for this device. Now, of course, very important, there has been um, organized by Dr. Tsikas, um, the who will talk later today, the multi-center experience with Amplet Sarcadic Plug device, um, which included um, the centers that had the main experience uh, with this um, device for LAA closure. Here we are included 969 patients, and finally 928 patients could be analyzed for the risk of stroke and the bleeding uh, risk in the follow-up. This is a retrospective study. What is interesting that indeed the majority of uh, implantations were done in patients where the anticoagulation was perceived problematic, so the patients had in 41% a previous major bleeding or a high bleeding risk, or they had the need of triple therapy because of um, stenting. So the majority of uh, implantations was clearly done in patients who had a, a very high bleeding risk. So that is, I think, also the perceived need for the approach of um, LAA closure. In this study, um, there was, of course, no uh, randomization or no control to uh, anticoagulation, so that could be compared to the estimated uh, JETS uh, mask score based on the risk factors of these patients. And on the left side, you see the estimated uh, risk score um, was 5.62, and the observed rate of strokes in this population was 2%, so there was um, much lower stroke it observed as what you would predict from the um, JETS2 VASC score. And on the right side you see, based on the HASPLET score, the calculated risk of bleeding, and then the observed uh, risk of bleeding, and again there was a lower um, risk of bleeding observed after ACP LAA closure as compared to the calculated risk of bleeding. I think this data are retrospective, and um, clearly the, there's now um, starting another prospective uh, multi-center registry, which is also monitored, and I think we already mentioned that in the first talk today that it's very important to get more observed and monitored uh, data using this approach. I think, from my standpoint, uh, it's clearly the need for this approach is perceived at the moment in patients who have a very high bleeding risk or contraindication for anticoagulation, and it's interesting what happens with the NOACs now, in this uh, patient population, I brought you one example, a paper now in press in circulation, where it was analyzed after the FDA approval of Debigatran and Rivaroxaban, how this is used in patients with uh, hemodialysis. It's a population about of 30,000 patients. And the conclusion was that, indeed, more dialysis patients are now started on Debigatran and Rivaroxaban, even when their use is contraindicated um, and because, of course, Dabigatran accumulates in dialysis patients and um, no studies are available to support the benefits or that this would, uh, the benefits would outweigh the risk in these patients. And in fact, in the secondary analysis, there was suggest that the morbidity and mortality from bleeding was higher with Dabigatran or Rivoxaban as compared to warfarin. So clearly, in, this is one example of a patient population we will discuss this afternoon. Anticoagulation is problematic, in particular, even more problematic with the new, some of the new uh, oral anticoagulants. Here you see the uptake of Dabigatran and Rivaroxaban used in patients with chronic hemodialysis. You see after FDA approval, there's a significant increase, and then when you um, had also Rivaroxaban approved, there was a further increase. And in this analysis from the uh, Mass General Hospital, you see that the actual observed bleeding rate was uh, higher in the Dabigatran and Rivaroxaban group. I apologize that I cannot show you now with the pointer. 
But um, if you look at the fourth line, you see the total major bleeding rate, and you see 13% uh, with warfarin, 10% with aspirin, and 34% with dabigatran, and 25% with rivaroxaban. So there was even a higher bleeding rate using this new anticoagulants. Thank you very much. Which, um, which uh, could be due to the accumulation of dabigatran in these uh, patients. And in the lower part, you see the embolic events, and if, of course, it's not a randomized study, this is a real-world observation in 30,000 dialysis patients, but you see that even the embolic events were higher in the group with the novel anticoagulants, suggesting clearly uh, that um, in these patients that have a contraindication to this uh, NOAX, uh, that um, the uh, bleeding risk and the ischemic risk may actually, could actually be higher. So that's a population where I think LA closure is certainly an alternative. Of course, LA closure is a rapidly developing field. You um, will hear much more today on the developments of uh, the M Pletzer AMOLED device, which is following the ACP device. We heard already about the Watchman data clearly. These are the two devices where we have most data and experience as far as now. The Coherix device is a CE marked, so that is also um, taking up. There is a company in Germany called Oclotech that is uh, running a CE study uh, using a device that has no um, arcs, but rather um, tries to be more um, soft to the left at atrial appendix, and they try to make this um, basically stable, so there is still the CE study ongoing, and there is in China an interesting device in development um, that um, I think will also start a large uh, registry, and um, I think that, as you can see, there are many devices now in developing showing the interest in that field, and I think also the perceived need from the patient side for this approach. I think in summary, uh, clearly, in addition to the new novel anticoagulants, we have the need of developing non-pharmacological approaches to prevent strokes because there are clearly patients who cannot tolerate long-term anticoagulation or have clear contraindications, as we heard also in the first talk, mainly we have data from Protect RF, Prevail, and the ACP multicenter experience. The number of patients included in this analysis are, of course, substantially lower compared to the anticoagulation studies, so therefore, I think it's hard to claim that LA occlusion could be a primary approach, but it's rather an approach that we consider for patients who have contraindication or major bleeding risk with anticoagulation. And I think this is shown also here in particular this is the patient population where LAA closure today is an increasingly used treatment option and may be considered. Thank you very much for your attention.